it's one of the very, very few movies that teenagers can watch and be blown away by and not be completely insulted. Teenagers are actually in some weird way comforted by the movie because because they don't draw back from the heartlessness, that they can kind of take joy in realizing that maybe there's a high school worse than theirs. Dear diary, my teen angst bullshit has a body count. As a child of the 80s and a teenager of the 90s, there are tons of media influences that shaped and molded me into the cynical, sarcastic, and jaded lover of film and music that I am today. Be it the nonstop onslaught of MTV and Nickelodeon on my senses, the totally tubular, rebellious attitude of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, or the wonderfully immersive bit-based wonderlands provided by Nintendo and Sega, there was certainly never a shortage of stimulation within my sphere. In particular, I found myself gravitating towards film and television centered around school life, as it was not only relatable, but in comparison to the drab nature of my school experience, it stood as a fictional beacon of what the experience could be like. Be it Saved by the Bell, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, The Breakfast Club, Degrassi Junior High, Parker Lewis Can't Lose, Beverly Hills 90210, or countless other titles, one thing stood consistent throughout this media. By the end of the film or the show, everything would be okay. Maybe that's what made Heather such a mind-blowing, eye-opening, and shocking experience for me. As a Beetlejuice fan and a preteen boy, Winona Ryder was already on my radar, and thanks to my love for skateboarding, Gleam in the Cube introduced me to Christian Slater. Outside of these two familiar elements, though, nothing about Heather's felt familiar. And dare I say, Heather's may have served as one of my original introductions to the concept of edgy, controversial, and boundary-pushing material. Naturally, as with many forward-thinking pieces of media, Heather's was met with lukewarm and critical reception and it was a complete flop at the box office. But thanks in part to the grunge-shaped cloud that was on the horizon, Heather's managed to find itself a cold audience. As the years go by, many critics have not only reversed their take on the film, but time has shown that life is doing its best to catch up with the darkly satirical outlook of Heather's. I think a lot of actors were really scared of the material. Um, I remember a specific incident that will stay with me forever where my agent at the time who I left shortly after this happened got down on her hands and knees and begged me not to do Heather's she said that it would ruin my career and I would never work again Before we dive into what makes Heather such a fascinating and somewhat prophetical work, it would be best to take a look at the story it tells. Veronica Sawyer, played by Ryder, is a reluctant member of the most influential clique at Westerberg High School, the Heathers. Led by Heather Chandler, portrayed confidently and brilliantly by Kim Walker, who was seemingly always flanked by Heather Duke and Heather McNamara, played by Shannon Doherty and Liz Ann Falk, respectively. The group uses their good looks and popularity to make their high school experience better, while making sure that the rest of the student body is painfully aware of their place within Westerberg society. This already volatile ecosystem is knocked off balance by the arrival of J.D., played by Slater, who makes his presence known by resolving a verbal spat between himself and two star football players by pulling out a real gun and firing blanks at them in front of the entire lunchroom not only earning him an immediate suspension, but also earning him the admiration of Veronica, who was disenchanted with her place in the Heathers. After a night out at a college party for Veronica and Heather Chandler, which ends less than ideally, Veronica finds herself gravitating towards J.D., who swiftly begins encouraging her that her friends are less than ideal. Inspired by J.D., Veronica convinces him to join her in a bit of playful revenge on Heather Chandler, but what was supposed to be a joke quickly devolves into a case of manslaughter at best and murder at worst. In a fit of fear and confusion, Veronica is convinced by J.D. to stage the scene of the crime as a suicide, and ironically, the series of events only serves to turn Heather Chandler into a teenage martyr. With Heather Chandler out of the picture, 
a power vacuum opens. And with the student body's emotions running high, the two remaining Heathers find themselves struggling in opposite ways with their place in the school ecosystem. Meanwhile, JD's influence on Veronica begins to manifest as a string of stage suicide deaths, ultimately setting up a showdown of opposing wills between Veronica and JD that leaves the fate of the entire student body hanging in the balance. While Heather's is an obvious homage to high school centered films of the era like Fast Times at Ridgemont High or the near entirety of the John Hughes Hoover, said homage is done in a very contrarian, tongue in cheek fashion, giving Heather's a bite that the aforementioned films lack in spite of their staying power. We were all kind of really sick of those movies. They had become kind of a caricature of adolescence. Everything was so sweet and, and loving that I wanted to kind of have fun with that. There are a lot of really smart kids out there who don't want to be insulted by John Hughes. I was never a fan of John Hughes' movies at the time. It is this inherent edge that makes Heather's age like a fine wine, while most of his peers seem to only look more and more dated as the years go by. Despite their well-intentioned meanings and attempts at capturing teenagers, in the decade where teenagers had the biggest mainstream cultural identity since the 1950s. While films like The Breakfast Club, 16 Candles, or Fast Times at Ridgemont High touch upon teen angst-filled issues like toxic relationships, suicide, and personal identity issues, none of them do so with the bluntness, directness, and hyper-stylized zeal of Heather's. The film also utilizes and touch a 1950s style and presentational approach. If for nothing else is an element to hold up against the youthful 1980s essence that drives the film. Writer Daniel Waters definitely had lofty aspirations for the film he was writing that eventually evolved into Heather's. My friend called me one day and said, you have to read this script that Dan Waters wrote. It's really funny, it's really unusual, it's really great, and he's looking for an agent and he needs your help. So I said, sure. He was looking for a script, and I, you know, wheeled out my wheelbarrow of my 265-page script, and, you know, he read it. Well, this is funnier than anything I've ever read. It's weirder as comedy than anything I've read by any of my contemporaries. And I thought it was bordering on incoherent because it was so filled with so much stuff. Yeah, it was a lot longer. At the time, of course, I thought Stanley Kubrick was going to be directing it. He can get away with a three-hour and 20-minute movie. <laughs> While he may not have been able to see his vision manifest in its original form, one thing that definitely was not sacrificed was the extremely unique and memorable voice through which his characters speak. On the one hand, the teenagers in his film serve as immature versions of adults, while the adults are essentially just refined children. And this is achieved through allowing the teenage actors and characters to populate the world of Heathers to take part in banter just above their age level without undercutting the adult tones by allowing them to still be kids and also making the parents and adults largely absent throughout the course of the film. This juxtaposition is achieved via one key aspect, the serious tones and manner in which a large majority of the characters speak is mixed with a healthy dose of slang that is either a spiritual synonym to existent slang of the time or in the best cases slang that feels as if it were wholly invented specifically for the Heathers universe. I mean, he created a whole dialogue that a lot of people started using, and, and it sort of caught on. What is your damage, Heather? Heathers was written around the time of the death of Brad as a term from a utilitarian purpose. Like, I thought, OK, if I create my own kind of language, then I can't be criticized for it being dated. Did you have a brain tumor for breakfast? He can take the way people really speak and pervert it and distort it. Why are you pulling my dick? He likes to put words in people's mouths that no real human being would ever say. There was a review talking about the slang said, Waters revels in his own unspeakable creation. <laughs> a good, bad way to put it. With a familiar framework in place occupied by fully realized members of the Westerberg Society, Waters and director Michael Lehman were able to hone in on and focus the film's extremely dark and biting satire to a laser precise level. Despite being presented as a high school film, Heathers has many meaningful things to say on a vast array of topics, including capitalism. There's always been a snappy snack shack. Any town, any time, the 
pop a ham and cheese in the microwave and feast on a turbo dog. Keeps me sane. Homosexuality. And what did your boyfriend say when you told him you were moving to Sherwood, Ohio? Eating disorders and image issues. Come on, Heather, let's take another look at today's lunch. Relationship manipulation. Shut up! I didn't know what the... Oh, come on, you Mary did. You just not... Little lamb, little lamb, little I know lamb. what you... Little lamb. Young love. Gaslighting. They're like tranquilizers. Only they uh, break the surface of the skin enough to cause a little blood but no real damage. So it looks like the person's been shot and killed and really they're just lying there unconscious and bleeding? Right. And more, which we will go into depth on momentarily. The often flat, when not overly farcical delivery of these topics makes the normally heavy and controversial subject matter not only more easy to digest and ruminate over, but it does so in ways that stick with you forever after just a singular viewing. Interestingly enough, one aspect of the film that always stuck with me was something that it approached with restraint. And that would be its portrayals of the Heather's Click specifically, Veronica directly, and the remainder of the women in the film in general. With such a heavy female presence in a clear-cut statement film, most writers or directors would have taken the opportunity to include a feminist statement of some sort into the film. For my money's worth, it's the absence of this heavy feminist angle that allows the film to work so well as a cautionary tale, specifically because it allows viewers to cheer for Veronica and attempt to sympathize with the complicated existence of the three Heathers without feeling as if they're being preached at or talked down to. The world of Heathers, in spite of its lack of a feminist statement, is one where the feelings, thoughts, and opinions of women are just as important, if not more so, than those of the men in the film. Looking at Heathers with the benefit of hindsight has been a really interesting experience, as this perspective has not only revealed just how far ahead of its time the film was, but as mentioned in the opening, how prophetic the film has sadly and ironically become. Teenagers mimicking adulthood is nothing new, but there is something about the way that Heathers is able to display that teenage agony of having one foot in adulthood and one foot in adolescence that is truly riveting. I highly doubt that anyone in 1989 saw the advent of the internet on the horizon or the way that it would usher in the information age. But one look at YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter or even your local school zone will show you just how much today's teenagers resemble the students of Westerberg High, as cries of social media eradicating the innocence of youth have been loud and numerous for nearly two decades now. Even if one were to look at the depiction of teenagers in today's media, anyone familiar with Heathers will likely not find themselves shocked when media like 13 Reasons Why, You, Riverdale, or Euphoria pop up as these highly stylized adult-esque depictions of teenagers most certainly owe a debt of gratitude to the foot that Heather's got in the symbolic door. In order to create tension within its world, Heather's does a bang-up job of handling problematic issues that plague us socially, be they in high school, online, or otherwise. The easiest issue to point out from Heather's is that of peer pressure and bullying, as these issues are the foundation in which the entire narrative is built upon. From the jump, we see that Veronica is entirely reluctant to be such a key member of the Heather's Collective, as the pressure exerted on her by Heather Chandler and company has not only alienated Veronica from her childhood friends, such as Betty Finn, but it's impeded her ability to get to know people like Martha Dunstock on anything other than a superficial and prejudiced level. Her journal entries are so hilarious and, and sad and tragic and funny and brilliant. I sometimes wondered, what if they got cut out after we did the movie? And I was so glad they didn't because they really showed the turmoil that she was going through. Outside of Veronica, the Heathers and other members of the student body face rampant body image issues, leading to illustrations of eating disorders and other self-esteem based personal problems.
There are also horribly toxic underlying currents of misogyny, voicing extremely negative objections towards homosexuality, which is sadly on brand for the Midwest. All right, now here's the one perfecto thing I picked up. Mineral water. Oh, come on. A lot of people drink mineral water. It's come a long way. Yeah, but this is Ohio. I mean, if you don't have a brewski in your hand, you might as well be wearing a dress. Not to mention the general objectification and disrespect of women. You know, I have a little prepared speech I tell my suitor when he wants more than I'd like to give him. Gee, Blake, I had a really nice... See the speeches from Malcolm X. I just want to get laid. That struggle that Veronica goes through in regard to her relationship with the Heathers, her toxicity-fueled intimacy with JD, and her lack of connection with anyone else illustrates the issues of fake friendships, manipulation and gaslighting on a micro level, and on a macro level, it illustrates the insane amount of importance that we give to the hierarchy of power that makes up the average high school experience. And I think that it was the first movie that really portrayed it partially, but yet accurately. What kids do to each other in high school is as bad as what adults do to each other in war and divorce. I know that it can be ruthless. I got called names. And I went through phases when I was incredibly unpopular and then phases when I was popular. I think that it can actually scar someone. You never sort of forget the way that you were treated in high school. Your high school scars are way deeper than your divorce scars or your Vietnam scars. While films like The New Guy illustrate this hierarchy on a very surface level, Heathers does the societal shadow work of forcing everyone to be brutally honest about their place in the structure, as well as their level of acceptance for said place. For example, as mentioned several times previously, Veronica is clearly at the top of the food chain, but is completely filled with regret and remorse about her position. By comparison, Martha Dunstock is shown to be someone at the bottom of the food chain with desires to make it to the top, hence her willingness to bite on the cruel jokes that Heather's play on her, or her eventual suicide attempt in hopes of finding posthumous popularity. In the days that when we made Heather's, teen suicide was an issue. You know, we were in the same size, and sometimes we could borrow each other's clothes and mix it up. It was fun. But it was handled so ludicrously by the media, and that's, I think, what inspired Dan to write the script. Speaking of Martha's attempt, part of the darkly satirical nature of Heather's is its willingness to be completely upfront about the sick and sad practice of exploiting suicide and mental illness. A practice that almost always ends up snowballing into deeply negative situations. With Heather Chandler's death being ruled a suicide in light of her lofty position at Westerberg High, the entire ecosystem of the school is thrown into disarray, and in an attempt to get a handle on things, the administration and teaching staff make several bad choices and critical mistakes. Obviously, I'm not making fun of real people who have actually committed suicide, but just the whole idea of teen suicide, it almost had become a sacrament where all these parents and teachers and students would come together and realizing that we had loved him all along and he was a great beaming beacon of light. The administrative side looks at the death as a burden and an interruption of the standard flow. And in a show of cold-hearted administrative execution, the students are given the most minimal of passing words in regard to arguably the most popular person on the campus. Now, is this Heather the cheerleader? That would be Heather McNamara. Damn, I'd be willing to go a half a day for a cheerleader. As a result, rather than the students looking at this as a time to mourn, it becomes essentially a school announcement that canonizes Heather Chandler while simultaneously inspiring Heather Duke to make an attempt at stepping into the powerful void left behind by Chandler. Once the news gets a hold of the story, however, guidance counselor Penelope Milford takes the completely opposite approach of the administration, choosing to essentially turn the school into a Heather Chandler Remembrance Society, which not only validates JD in a deeply dark manner, but inspires him to continue a sinister action. What's your name? Hi. I'm Heather Duke. Look at me. Stop. Metalhead. Let me hear. Let's see something together. 
Is this as good for you as it is for me? If we take a brief moment to single out JD, this portrayal gives us a complex mixed bag of toxic masculine traits that, in a less comedic presentation, would come off as downright terrifying to the average viewer. That thing you pulled in the calf today was pretty severe. Yeah, well, the extreme always seems to make an impression. We touched upon this briefly a second ago, but JD stands as one of the best examples of cinematic gaslighting I can remember. He is not hesitant at all to flatly tell Veronica her feelings are wrong. Look, you believed it because you wanted to believe it. Your true feelings were too gross and icky for you to face. He often pairs messages of love with messages of despicable acts. Chaos is what killed the dinosaurs, darling. Face it, our way is the way. I mean, we scare people into not being assholes. Our way is not our way. Oh, yeah, tell that to the judge, all right? Tell it to Kurt Kelly. Oh. And when things get so dire for Veronica that she decides to fake her own death in hopes of shocking JD out of his manipulative nature, he only has criticism and scorn for her. Damn it, Veronica. We could have toasted marshmallows together. By the time that Veronica is able to build up the courage and fortitude to take a stand for herself, JD's stalkerish behavior and manipulative tactics have gotten so deeply ingrained in his need for validation that he ultimately turns his externalized hatred inward, ironically making him the tragically unwilling hero that saves the Westerberg student body from the villain that he created. The presence of JD also opens up the door for discussions about the then existing but soon to balloon out of control epidemic of gun violence within schools. The frankness that JD shows in terms of using a gun to solve even the most minor of issues is still as shocking now as it was then, as he not only ends up shooting Kirk Kelly and Ram Sweeney after firing blanks at them earlier in the film, but he even goes so far as to shoot his radio in the midst of an argument with, with Veronica in order to drive her into further hysterics. Which is even more ironic considering that his father had just left the room after discussing how he used explosives to prove his own point against the city's objections of demolishing a building. I wouldn't go so far as to identify JD as an incel, but he certainly has some of the characteristics that society has placed on these individuals within his makeup, making him an extremely volatile and dangerous live wire to any population he inserts himself into. Heathers isn't necessarily the most complex or layered film out there, but there's definitely enough symbolism within its midst to keep repeat viewers interested, intrigued, and on their toes. Veronica is obviously the most persistent presence of symbolism in the film, as her existence denotes the way many teenagers feel out of sync with the world they're supposed to fall in line with. The irony of Veronica being a key member of the Heathers, despite being the only one not named Heather, immediately sets her up as a multifaceted rebel, with her presence in the Heathers Collective making her feel like an implanted insurgent, hoping to blow up the entire group from within, though she does not have the motivation or drive to do so when we are introduced to her. References to her childhood friend Betty Finn also exist as a symbolic inside joke with Veronica and Betty's first names standing as a reference to the famed frenemies from the Archie comics, and their Sawyer and Friends surnames chosen as an homage to Mark Twain's famed best friends Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. Westerberg High School, though not a symbol in itself, is the framework for a handful of important teenage-based symbolism instances that gives Heather's additional substance. The aforementioned hierarchy and the subsequent actions that shake it up play out like an immature version of social Darwinism in the sense that the survival of the fittest we see is full of lies, deception, surface level understanding, and emotionally detached decision making. Veronica's existence at Westerberg also illustrates the way that the public school system fails the gifted. Though not explicitly stated, it is heavily implied that Veronica is both intellectually and socially outpacing her peers. But due to Westerberg's fierce dedication to the status quo, Veronica's gifts and intuitions are essentially squandered 
for meaningless lunchtime polls and the organization of unimportant social gatherings. Playing our song. Here it is. Big Fun and their background permeance is an interesting bit of symbolism, as their presence within the narrative is a sort of invisible support for the previously mentioned exploitation of the teenage suicide epidemic that Westerberg is facing. Much like the school administration, guidance counselor Milford and Heather Duke, Big Fun's hit single is wholly and unashamedly a cash grab attempt to raise their profile among the youth of Westerberg and beyond. The band is so blatant in this cash grab attempt that they can't even implement the subtlety of a band like Foster the People, whose single Pumped Up Kicks was a clever analogy for teenage gun violence that went over many people's heads. In startling contrast, Big Fun's single, Teenage Suicide, Don't Do It, not only serves to broadcast a suicide epidemic to people that likely were not aware of it previously, but its directness and lack of subtext almost comes off as an ironic advertisement for the opposite, encouraging the youth to actually commit suicide in hopes of finding popularity and recognition while the epidemic is still fashionable. The Heather's creators also use instances of faith and religion wisely to offset the absurdness of the reality that it is Sherwood, Ohio, though they do so sparingly and with just enough care so as not to offend. What are you doing tonight? I don't know. Morning. Maybe watch some TV. Why? The church in itself is approached appropriately satirically, at least for Heather Chandler's funeral, with the preacher's sincere message of turning towards Jesus for solace actually being sound advice. We must pray that the other teenagers of Sherwood, Ohio, know the name of that righteous dude solve their problems. It's Jesus Christ, and he's in the bulk. Though it is played very heavy-handedly and for laughs. This message is also jarring in contrast to the parade of prayers from the student body, who use these prayers as their singular opportunity to reveal honest aspects of themselves to viewers. I prayed for the death of Heather Chandler many times, and I felt bad every time I did it, but I kept doing it anyway. Now I know you understood everything. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. By the time we get to Heather Duke's funeral, or what is likely Veronica's fever dream version of it, we are presented with a surrealist, shallow representation of the suicide fever that has swept Sherwood, right down to the ghost of Heather Chandler mocking the funeral for its lack of turnout. I had at least 70 more people at my funeral. We already touched upon how JD is a proxy for toxic masculinity and the phenomenon of gaslighting, but he also stands as a warning sign for how the school shooter complex can be developed in disenchanted youth. For starters, he is essentially an orphan due to the traumatic circumstances that he faces. His mother is dead from what is implied to be the hand of his father, and his father is money hungry and adrenaline junkie and wholly willing to be the child in their father and son relationship. Therefore, he is essentially left to his own devices, and with the wealth of explosives, firearms, and financial resources at his grasp, he is a walking and talking ticking time bomb. Add to this the fact that his father is more than willing to chase money from city to city, and it's easy to see why JD is more at home being a loner as he seemingly never is given the chance or the time to develop friendships or peer groups that will allow him to vent his frustrations while giving him a sense of support. He is immediately singled out for being unfamiliar at Westerberg, and based on what we assume is his past experience of dealing with this hostility, his answer is to immediately establish dominance in the most extreme way possible via the threat of gun violence. He does make a positive step by developing a relationship with Veronica, but it becomes immediately apparent that this relationship was established as a means to an end, with JD's sense of self-righteousness apparently brought to life by the Heather's clique, 
Veronica merely serves as a pawn for JD to use in his ultimate endgame of making an example out of the Westerberg student body. Since the March 31st, 1989 release of this film, there have been roughly 450 school shooting incidents in the United States. Parents, teachers, and administrators have banded together in an attempt to quell the juvenile practices of bullying that have always existed, but have become more prevalent in the wake of the internet's emergence and growing accessibility. Studies have shown how susceptible children and teenagers are to unrealistic beauty standard depictions. And slowly, the tide has been turning towards an overall general acceptance of people, no matter their weight, height, skin color, or so on, though we are far from the dream of a utopian society. Sadly, the United States public education system has not improved far beyond the depiction it has given in Heather's and other high school films over the years which has caused a shift towards parents enrolling children in private and charter schools. I say that to say this. Heathers, as entertaining as it was and still is, should be recognized for how directly its finger was on the pulse of both teenage culture and society as a whole, moving into the rapid shifts that took place in the 1990s, the turn of the century, and the 2010s. The forward-thinking nature of writer Daniel Waters and director Michael Lehman should be praised as it helped those of us who are paying attention make the much needed adjustments that much easier as life got louder and more problematic. Thank you once again for tuning into this episode of Doom on Film. If you like what you've seen and heard, please like the video. And if you have anything to add to the discourse, feel free to leave a comment below. If you want to be around when new videos drop, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Until next time, take care of yourselves and keep that love for film burning bright. The movie is called Lethal Attraction. Lethal Attraction. I think it was actually released as that in Europe. So me and Michael always used to call the movie Fatal Weapon.